Thank you very much. Um, good evening, distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, the esteemed members of the Oxford Union. I wish to profoundly acknowledge how grateful I am to be here at this very important institution of uh, higher learning, an institution of prestige, a giant in terms of uh, producing international leaders, global leaders. I'm particularly fortified by the fact that I'm standing where Albert Einstein has stood before in 1933. Mm -hmm. I'm particularly fortified by the fact that I've shared platforms with colleagues and giants before, like Ronald Reagan, the president, people like John Major, people like John Kerry. That brings me to that league, and I'm very grateful. Thank you, Mr. President, for inviting me. Thank you. This is a wonderful opportunity. Most of you may not know, but I'm here to share a story, a story about a great people, a great continent, and a great country, a country called Zimbabwe. This is a country of a beautiful people, a hardworking people, an industrious people. Yes, a hardworking people, a peace-loving people, but a smart people too. People who have had everything in terms of resources, everything in terms of competences and capacities, except leadership. And this is why I'm here. Yes, leading Zimbabwe into the future and leading Africa into the future. Clearly aware of the fact that yes, the diet is going up. The old is dying. But the new has not yet been born. But I represent that new. The new which is about to be ushered in the context of our 2018 elections. Yes, in three months' time, we are going into an election. One of the most crucial elections of our lifetime. As crucial as the election in 1980 when we attained our independence. But this one is very crucial. Not just because of time. Not just because of circumstances. But because of the epoch that we are entering into. This is an election to move from the liberation promise to the transformation promise. This is an election to usher in the new, not the promise sterile new, but the real new in delivery. This is the election to see young people playing a role on the African continent. Yes, fulfilling that historical task. The things that we are going to make sure we fulfill and record for future generations. As you know, one of the celebrated scholars, Franz Fanon, had this to say, every generation must, out of relative obscurity, discover its mission, betray it, or fulfill it. Our choice is to make sure that we fulfill our historical mission. Our historical mission is transformation. Our historical mission and historical task, our revolutionary mandate, is to make sure that we transform Zimbabwe into a modern state. We transform Zimbabwe into a great country. We transform Zimbabwe into that nation to which people will be happy to associate with. Yes, our history has been a history which is checkered, a history of a pariah state, of a banana republic, under the hands of Mr. Mugabe, but we are shedding off in a way that history. We are not yet in the new, but we are on the route to the new. I can tell you that a lot of you are aware that Mr. Mugabe exited the stage last year in November when there was a combination of forces to try and bring in a new dispensation. Like I said, according to Gramsci, Antonio, there has been the death of the old, but there hasn't been the new. It's proving to be difficult for the new to be born. And why is the new being a problem to be born? There are obstacles on the route to transformation. What are those obstacles? The obstacles are in the electoral minefield that we have in Zimbabwe. Elections in Zimbabwe have been contested since 1980. Elections in Zimbabwe have always bred a disputed outcome since 1980. Why? Because of state-sponsored violence. Why? Because of electoral skullduggery and machinations in terms of how elections are managed. Why? Because we have not been able to move from the big man to the big idea. Why? Because Africa has been dominated by strong men and not strong institutions. Why? Because Africa has suffered because we're focused on personalities and not focusing on ideas, policies, and programs that move Africa ahead. And those are the issues we hope to correct as we go into this election. 2018 is so crucial. For us in Zimbabwe, we've managed to introduce the new. We just do not represent the new in 
the freshness of the face. We also represent the new in the freshness of ideas, in the freshness of our narrative, in the freshness of the politics that we belong to and we represent. Yes, I must make mention, Mr. President, that we had President Sangra an icon, the face of the struggle in Zimbabwe, on the African continent, who passed on in February. I've had to come in. His boots are very big, but I've tried to fill them in. And I can tell you that the boots are quite heavy, but I'm carrying them, and I'm running, and I'm going to win. I can assure you. I can assure you that we are giving a fighting chance to the people of Zimbabwe as we go into this election. Why are we saying so? We are saying so because we know that in any struggle, we must be able to stand up and be counted and to define a narrative to which people have to come through. We did it before as a people. During the liberation struggle, we forgot about race. We forgot about class. We forgot about tribes. We forgot about all the other classes that may separate us to look at the great idea of liberation. We achieved that liberation, but that liberation was checked halfway. Why? Because of exhausted nationalism. Why? Because we had those who came into power failing to realize that occupying power is not for self-empowerment or self-entitlement. Title is not for the self, but for others. We have not done things for others, but for ourselves, which has been the biggest problem on the African continent that when leaders assume positions of responsibility, they forget that the primary objective is service and sacrifice, and they begin to think about themselves, building a parasitic elite that is focusing on self-aggrandizement at the expense of the populace. That is what we need to cure, and this is where our mandate is. This is where our mission is, to make sure that the liberation agenda that has been checked halfway is fulfilled. I have a lot of respect of Robert Mugabe the Young, Though I do not have any respect of Robert Mugabe the Old, because he betrayed the ideals of Robert Mugabe the Young, who was a liberation icon. The Old was a person who betrayed what he stood for when he was young. I suppose there's something wrong with age, but I don't think so. Age comes with wisdom, but with Mr. Mugabe it came alone. And these are the things we want to make sure we are able to deal with, particularly for our leaders on the African continent. And this is why I'm saying, as a young man, who is an advocate, who is an African, who is a Democrat, who is a believer in constitutionalism, who is a believer in the rule of law, who is a believer in vision, everything in Africa rises or falls with leadership. Once we get our leadership right, we get everything right. The shortage in Africa is not a shortage of resources, but a shortage of leadership, which is manifesting itself in a shortage of many other things. When you see disease in Africa, you are not seeing disease, you are seeing a death of leadership. That is the first thing we have to cure. How do we cure it? We cure it by making sure that we put Zimbabwe on the path to a free and fair election. How do we achieve a free and fair election? We have put certain benchmarks to achieve that free and fair election so that we are able, when we go to an election, to allow Zimbabweans to define themselves so that we go back to the ideal of the liberation struggle. One man, one woman, one vote. Let the people decide. Let the people choose their leaders. In Africa, our tragedy has been the tragedy of self-reproduction. People coming to tell us that they are new when we know that they're sterile and finished in terms of the narrative that they are giving. And that is where we want to take our country back to. And this is where we are going to correct, to say in terms of reforms, let us have reforms for free and fair elections. We have articulated a number of issues we have said we want to put in place in terms of resources, in terms of reforms, in terms of benchmarks, so that the trajectory to a new election is an election that is beyond contestation. And we count on the international community to support the initiative for a free and fair election. This is why we count on the global prefects of democracy in Africa, in terms of the AU, SADC, in the world, in terms of the EU, the United Nations, and other big powers, including the United Kingdom. We count on you to put a case for governance, for free and fair elections, and for making sure that we have a democratic election in Zimbabwe come three months' time. What do we want to see? We want to see accountability in terms of the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission, which is supposed to be independent, but not entirely independent. We want to see the putting in place of the issue of the ballot paper and its auditing, because it has been a source of contestation in the past. We want to see the in auditing of the biometric uh, voter registration program that has been put in place. We want to also see uh, international observation, international oversight, which is very important. 
under seeing and under writing of this election by the international community is very key. Those are the reforms we'd want to see put in place within the shortest space of time. Some may say there's no time because there's three months. It's not a question of time. It's a question of political will. And what we have seen is that there's no political will on the part of Mr. Nangagwa, who is not a representation of the new, but a same perpetuation of the old. In fact, I must say, a lot of people were asking me, has there been any change in Zimbabwe? There's been change without change. What we have seen is just a transformation of movement of power from one person to another within the same system. We are seeing a replication and a perpetuation of the same Robert Mugabe politics, politics of marginalization, corruption, politics of unemployment, politics of uh, making sure that people are shut out of uh, decision making and very important uh, uh, leadership circles. So I must say, as we go into this election, we are just going there with all the difficulties we have. We have managed to crank the nation. We have managed to put the nation on a path to victory. I can tell you that the mood in the country is exciting. People are beginning to understand our new policies, our new politics, our new strategies, and they are connecting with our message. That connection is very important because it is the time for young people. Yes, our old generation did their bit in the liberation, but you can't be a hero of two struggles. The struggle for liberation had its own heroes, Mr. Munangagwa and Mr. Mugabe included, but now the liberation agenda is gone. It is the struggle for transformation, and we are expecting ourselves as young people to be the heroes of the transformation agenda. Having said that, I have a vision. The vision I have is to see the new Zimbabwe promise, to see Zimbabwe as a successful country in the family of nations, to see Zimbabwe being a friend of the United Kingdom and indeed the entire world. Having rejoined the Commonwealth, being one of the best countries, we have a beautiful people, a hardworking people, an intelligent people, we have a beautiful climate. If you come to Zimbabwe, you will never get any better arrangement. You will never come back you, you know, to the UK. You will just stay in Zimbabwe because Zimbabwe represents that best climate, that best thing on the earth in terms of the people who are so loving, so peace loving. And this is why we are saying we need to give Zimbabweans a chance as we go forward. Having said that, I would want to articulate my vision, the vision that I have for Africa, the vision that I have for the new Zimbabwe, once we start interacting. But I want to thank you for having me. I have given you my introductory remarks on what we stand for and where we are going. Thank you very much, Mr. President. All right. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I will ask a few questions before opening up to Thank the you. audience, if that's all right. Thank you. Um, so my first question is, what specifically did Tsvingerai uh, leave as his political le legacy for the MDC uh, and Zimbabwean opposition in general? Uh, what can you learn from his experience in the power sharing agreement? Thank you very much. President Tsvingerai uh, is a trade unionist, a Democrat. He did a lot of things. Among the things that he did was to leave the legacy of working together, the legacy of unity, the legacy of people being able to be humble enough to save and sacrifice for their own generations. And I must say that as a trade unionist, he did a lot to show us peace and nonviolent politics. Mr. Tsangrai never resorted to arms of war. He was provoked many times. He used nonviolence as a tool to engage and to democratize. And that is his legacy. He believed in nonviolence, he believed in peace, and that's why we will continue to move on that path. Because what builds nations is not violence, but peace, amity, and dialogue. Perfect. Thank you. So you mentioned um, in your speech the distinction between uh, the old Mugabe and the new Mugabe. Uh, and Mugabe referred extensively to his experience um, in the Liberation War. Um, and the veterans are still a politically powerful tool. How do you think Zimbabwean politics and move beyond these hit historical issues? Um, and do uh, they hold the country back? Well, we have historical issues that are obviously going to affect uh, future generations. If we're not able to build our politics around policies, around institutions, around ideas, around values, particularly values in constitutionalism, values in democracy, values in rule of law, values in making sure that we advance that ability to engage, to debate issues, to envision together as a people, that is what we must do so that we move away and transform ourselves from the politics of the big man 
to the politics of the big idea so that we follow ideas and not follow individuals. Because when you follow individuals, the demise of individuals, the betrayal of individuals is always going to haunt the nation. This is what we want to correct. Perfect. So um, you also mentioned about the Commonwealth and Zimbabwe and the Commonwealth nations have a tense uh, diplomat diplomatic relationship, whereas Zimbabwe was suspended in 2002 for breaching the Harare Declaration. Uh, what do you think of Zimbabwe's rep relationship with the com Commonwealth moving forward? Uh, and if elected president, would you in intend to increase diplomatic ties? Well, I must say that uh, Zimbabwe must be one of the celebrated centers of democracy and good governance, rule of law. Once I become, and I'm not saying if, but when, when I become president in July, I'm going to make sure that the first thing we do is to take Zimbabwe back into the family of nations so that we remove our banana status and banana tag and this pariah status. How do we do this? We're going to do it by making sure that we respect the values and norms that are internationally set, particularly in the Commonwealth. In particular, the 1991 Right Declaration uh, in terms of the Commonwealth. Those are the dictates we are going to respect. And I can assure you that, um, yes, Zimbabwe will be a respectable member of the family of nations once we form the government. We are not going to be butchering our citizens. Instead of protecting the people, the current state has been persecuting the people. We need to reverse that so that we have a caring and a sharing state, a very developmental state, a democratic state that is able to feed and address the concerns of the citizens. Absolutely. Um, so a recent High Court judge says that the issues of legitimacy uh, and the MDCT cannot be re re uh, resolved on a popularity basis. Uh, could you explain the legitimacy problem that has arisen and how you intend to solve it? Well, um, I'm sure you're aware that uh, all transitions are always difficult. We've had one of the most unfortunate developments in our party that we have lost the icon, the founding father of our party, uh, Dr. Richard Morgan Trangrai. So we have had to move from that situation to try and make sure that we put in place a vehicle that will win elections, particularly in the context of the uh, uh, broad alliance, uh, the Grand National Union, uh, the bread convergence with other political parties. So we have an alliance that we have come up with, with seven political parties. Within that context, we've had leaders who have not been comfortable with unity. And it's so surprising how unity has become the source of disunity. Uh, the pursuit of unity by other political parties has also caused certain members not to be comfortable with certain arrangements. And this is what has caused other members to choose not to be part of the grant union. But you know that unity is less costly. Unity is the winning formula. And this is the direction we have taken, that we need a grand coalition of all the progressive parties, seven of them. Of course, we are still reaching out to others so that we are able to mount a formidable challenge against uh, the Zanu PF and dictatorship in our country. The return to legitimacy is one of our fundamental objectives, particularly as we go into July. So yes, it's something that we have been grappling with and dealing with, but it's not uh, something that has to be dealt with by the courts. It has to be dealt with by the people. Legitimacy is not conferred by courts, but by the constitutions that uh, run organizations. And we are so grateful that our constitution is very clear about how we are going to proceed. Um, as a follow-up question, you mentioned the need to be, build a big coalition. What do you think has been the biggest challenges in um, bringing in other political parties uh, to join? Trust. Course? Trust issues, confidence issues. You know that some of the members, ZANU-PF has imploded, which is the ruling party. Uh, it has split into almost five parties. So some of the leaders who have been in ZANU-PF, they are now coming to the opposition. We have been the traditional opposition. There are issues around who should then lead that opposition, who should be the face of that opposition, a trusted face, a tried face. We can't have a person who is coming from the S12 ruling party coming to lead the traditional opposition without issues of trust being under, you know, sorted out. In the past, we've had people who come from ZANU-PF to pretend to be in the opposition and then go back to ZANU-PF and leave us leaderless. So we have to be very clever and clear in terms of who is going to lead the alternative, once beaten, twice shy. So we are cleverer, and this is why we are insisting that whoever has to lead the opposition has to be from the mainstream opposition, and those comrades who are also seeing the light have to be part of the grand coalition. Um, so in a recent interview um, in January to the Financial Times, the current president has um, invited the United Nations, the EU, and a lot of in uh, international organizations uh, to come and monitor the elec upcoming elections in July. Uh, you've mentioned the need for the elections to be free and fair. Do you think they will be? Very difficult. I mean, once you have a contested process, it's difficult not to have a contested outcome. At the moment, we have contestations around the process. 
who have indicated to you and to the union that there are issues that have to be sorted out. Issues around the voters' straw, issues around uh, the independence of the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission, which is supposed to be an independent body, issues around um, the ballot paper, the ballot material to be used. Those are issues that are still zones of contestation. We are contesting around these issues because we want the election to be beyond contestation. And we know that without legitimacy, it's not possible to solve the political issues. Politics has been uh, a big problem for our economics. And we need to move from politics to economics so that we are able to transform the economy, make sure that we prosper and give opportunity to Zimbabweans for them to be able to move forward. So yes, the election is going to be contestable if we do not resolve the issues we are currently having. You know, inviting the UN, inviting the European Union or any other international observer is not the solution because it's just the outer uh, optics without necessarily addressing the substantive issues in terms of substance on the freeness and fairness of the election. Absolutely. Um, so I'll uh, ask one final question before opening up um, to the audience. Thank you. So recently um, you said that uh, you intended the desire to expel uh, Chinese investors uh, from Zimbabwe um, and China is the fourth largest investor. Could you explain more a bit about um, that decision within the economic policy? Well, our, our economic policy, our investment policy is not targeted at any nationality or any country. I must also clarify that position. I've said there are deals that have been undertaken by this government. Some of the deals are shared deals, deals that do not benefit our country, that do not benefit the nation, but they benefit the elites, the parasitic elites that have been going into deals with certain uh, countries and certain individuals who will do a forensic assessment and audit of each and every deal. Any deal that does not benefit Africa, that does not benefit Zimbabwe, is going to be revisited, revised and corrected. We do not want to have new masters on the African continent. We want to have new partners. We do not want to change the rider, but yet maintaining the same right on the African continent. So our choice of partners must not be a choice of riders, but a choice of people whom are going to partner with. So that is what I've said, because what we are seeing happening is that there are certain individuals, investors, who are coming in, having bad deals for our country, obviously, um, going in bed and boardrooms with certain of our leaders to the detriment of posterity and future generations. And we have generations to protect, and we protect them by making sure that we remedy all the wrongs, correct all the mistakes, and of course negate all the disadvantages we have so far encountered. Perfect, thank you. Um, so we'll, we'll now move on to some questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and wait for the microphone um, to reach you. Um, so for the first question, we'll go to the gentleman um, on my right. Thank you very much, dear sir. Mr. Chamisa, I must commend you on your courage for being a leader of Zimbabwe. It's never easy. You never know what's going to happen to you. But uh, on the note that our president here has just led us to, I would like to uh, quote Dr. Henry Kissinger on saying that, you know, every leader has a geopolitical arc that they have to deal with. Indeed. There's the rhetoric that you tell us and the reality of being a leader. Sure. When you become the leader of Zimbabwe, perhaps in September 2018, August. you will have to deal you will have to deal. You are delaying a bit, August. You will have to deal. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you need time to pack up your house. <laughs> Thank you, you will have to deal with uh, a, a resurgent China, with a strong Deng, uh, sorry, with a strong uh, Xi Jinping, who will yes. be around here forever. Sure. You will have a historical past with Britain sure. that is struggling to find its place in the world. Sure. You'll have a listless America. And also two other important factors, South Africa, yeah. And the most important investor in South Africa being the diaspora. Indeed. I would like you to answer two questions, and I'll take liberty to do this. Yeah. Which is, what is your message to the diaspora about what you're going to change in Zimbabwe sure. so that we can continue investing in our country? Sure. Because we do keep it afloat every day. Sure. The second question is, can you define better what you, in, what you intend for the relationship of Zimbabwe to be with China? Thank you very much. Um, let me start with the issue of the diaspora. As you may know, we have over three million Zimbabweans who are in the diaspora. And these are very important. You are aware that the diaspora has played a pivotal role in other jurisdictions, the case of Eritrea, the case of Ireland. And of course, our own case in Zimbabwe, every, so far, if we look at the contribution that has been made by the diasporans, almost a billion, that is not a joke, that is big. But our biggest issue is that we cannot have taxation without representation. 
the contribution of the diasporans to the upkeep of our economy must also be correspondingly met with the issue of making sure that there's diaspora vote. We must create a framework and environment for diasporans to be able to vote so that they define a leadership back home. But not only that, we must also make it conducive for those who are in the diaspora to come back home and start rebuilding their country. We need reconstruction and reform narrative around how we are going to harness the skills, the expertise we have, the technology transfer by those who are in the diaspora to come back home and start rebuilding our country. And this is why we have created a skills database for those who are in the diaspora so that we create a conducive environment for them to come back and contribute. So that's fundamental for us. We have also developed a diaspora policy which we are going to um, unpack and also reveal very soon. Make, meaning to say that we need to dock into the you know, skills that we have, the experience that is there. But it has been not a case, but a, a blessing that we have young people who are in the diaspora were able to come back to Zimbabwe to rebuild the country. So yes, it's good news uh, that the country is reforming, that the country, once we are already there, we are going to put that framework of reconstructing our economy and we would want the diasporans to be part of it. So I hope that I've answered you on the first question. The second question, in terms of our foreign policy, how are we going to deal with all these competing powers, particularly the context of China? Our relationship with China, like I indicated, should not be a relationship of unequals. It should be a relationship of a win-win. If we are to do business, let's do business on the basis of set values, set norms, around good governance, around human rights observance, around non-exploitation of citizens. Uh, of both countries. That is the basis of our engagement. Yes, China is a big global player, but we also understand the historical issues around our relationship with the United Kingdom. We need to revive that. This cat and mouse relationship with the British government and the British people is not helping our country because we have a historical link that we need to harness and harvest out of, we must cream off that important relationship. So the immediate thing we are going to do is to restore good and happy relations between the British and the Zimbabwean people so that we mutually build our countries for the common good. Um, as a quick follow-up question to that, um, mentioning you know, the change of power in South Africa, how do you see the relationship between Zimbabwe and South Africa moving forward as one of its biggest trade partners? Indeed, we must have a strong region. A strong region is only possible when we have a strong Zimbabwe and a strong Africa. For a long time, we have had Zimbabwe as the sick country of the region, and it has affected South Africa in a big way, economically and politically. So what we need to do is to make sure that going forward, we have a relationship, not just a trade union of leaders, leaders having solidarity at the expense of their people. We need to have a cross-pollination of ideas around building a strong relationship of citizens so that we build a common market, we build a customs union, and of course a monetary union to strengthen our region. Because the future is integration, the future is inclusivity, the future is to work together. That is the case with the European Union. Of course, I know you have your Brexit here, which is an issue, <laughs> but I must say that the future is inclusive. We need to be inter integrating, we need to be um, futuristic in our approach in working together. And that's the direction we are taking with, uh, with uh, South Africa. President Cyril Ramaphosa is a great African who has been very responsible in his reconciliation efforts within South Africa and in the region. Um, he has also played a pivotal role in the past in some other peacekeeping missions and other restorative missions. And we are going to harness on that experience to make sure that we build a greater continent, having that leadership. Obviously, as a young man, um, it's very important that uh, we have more young leaders who are coming to the fore in terms of the democratic discourse in countries. Within Zimbabwe, mind you, we have just had one leader since 1980, President Robert Mugabe. And I know some may say, oh, now we have a new leader. No. President Idi Munangagwa is Mr. Mugabe by another name. So we've just had one leader uh, since 1980 because there's not been any change in terms of the leadership in our country. Perfect, thank you. Um, on to the next question. Um, we'll go to the lady um, in the fifth row. Um, hi, thank you for coming to talk to us today. And I've had a couple of times been able to go down and visit Zimbabwe. And I've really enjoyed the time that I've spent there. Thank you. Um, I, Unfortunately, all over the world where, where Britain has had their empire, their, um, their way of dealing with people is divide and rule. Mm. And there is divisions in, in Zimbabwe. 
what are you going to do to help heal those divisions so that they don't destroy your dream going forward? And how soon do you think you're going to be able to rebuild and have your, your own currency back? Because when I went, there was Forex, and you, you, know, you were dependent on other people's currencies, and that, that doesn't give you the freedom to, you know, to make economic decisions going forward. Thank you. And, and thank you for loving Zimbabwe. We love you too. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. I must say that two issues there. The first one is the issue of uniting the country, which has been the tragedy of our country. We've had a country but not a nation. A nation is supposed to have values, it's supposed to have citizens, it's supposed to have institutions, it's supposed to have one common vision. We've not had that. Uh, President Mugabe has, has presided over our country for the past 37 years. And of course, Mr. Mnangagwa, again, perpetuating what Mr. Mugabe was doing for the past period of six months. Clearly, we have not had that sense of unity, that sense of purpose. And it's not because of the British. It's because of our leadership. When a nation is divided, is the leadership stupid? It can't be about foreigners. You can't credit foreigners for your own misfortunes and for your own deficit in leadership. It is clear that we have not... Uh, we have not provided leadership. There has been an under-leadership uh, by those who are in authority and over-management of those who are in the country. And that is what we must correct. How do we correct it? We need national healing. There have been serious problems, divisions around class, divisions around race. The people of Zimbabwe are so peace-loving. It has been the state that has been responsible for dividing the people. So we need a state that is able to unite people, to care for people, to also provide a new leadership narrative and of course unite people around a cohesive vision and that is what we are already doing to have a grand national union around issues, around the future, around uh, our past problems so that we have a common view about where we are going. So we are already doing that and it's very possible for us to unite and once we are united we will then make it very difficult for whoever would want to be a foreign hand to try and divide us. A united people can never be defe defeated. And I'm sure you know that about the United Kingdom. That's why it is the United Kingdom. You are united. That's why it is the United States of America. You are united. And we are equally going to be and should remain united as a people to deliver good prosperity and opportunity for all in our own context. In terms of the other issue which you mentioned in terms of our currents, we're very clear that our problems are not simple. But the biggest challenge in our country is not just a cash crisis. It is a confidence crisis. It is a trust crisis. The citizens are not trusting their state and their governors. So we need to at least restore trust and confidence. But not only that, we need to go back to a proper currency, a multi-currency system, a basket of currencies, as we prepare to deal with the fundamental issues around productivity, fundamental issues around making sure that there's production, not just on the farms, but in the industries and elsewhere. So that once there is productivity, we are able then to go back to our own currents at the appropriate time. Once we have resolved the fundamental issues around macroeconomic fundamentals and other structural issues that have to be dealt with. We used to be the breadbasket of Africa. We need to go back there. Now we have a, a, a basket case on account of a shortage of leadership. We need to correct that and go back to where we were able to produce, not just for ourselves, but for the whole world. Because we have the good soils, we have the good climate, we have powerful irrigation you know, schemes. We need to revive smart agriculture so that we're able to be back on our track. All right, thank you. Um, for the next question, we'll go to the hand just there. Oh, with the orange shirt. Uh, Mr. Chamisa, I would like to appreciate the big boots you are trying to fill in. Uh, the the Shanghai boots. But uh, we understand there were some uh, primary uh, elections in the, in, in the ruling party. Indeed. Uh, in those elections, there were, lots of, there were lots of riggings. How are you going to uh, stop those riggings in the next elections? Indeed. And my, my second question is, you have been uh, speaking, you might not have spoken of it, yeah? But you have been uh, speaking of uh, devolution. Sure. How long do you think the devolution will start taking place after you have inherited, inherited power? Indeed. 
Thank you very much. Let me start with the devolution one. Devolution starts in the mind. We must devolve authority, responsibility, power, and resources in the mind. And it has already begun. <coughs> because it has begun in terms of the scoping of our plan and our trajectory for a revolution in Zimbabwe to make sure that things are not centralized in one city or one region. We need to make sure that all the people of Zimbabwe enjoy the national cake. Part of what we are going to do is to reorganize the administrative capital to take it to Midlands. I've already mentioned that. Part of what we are going to do is to make sure that we uh, take resources in the local areas to also develop those local areas, making Mulawai the industrial and commercial capital, which is the second largest you know, city, but also making sure that Harare itself does not become the center of everything. We can't just take everything to be centered in Harare. I'm glad that here in the UK, things are not just centered in London. They are all over. We need to decentralize. Of course, I know that some may actually disagree, but things are all over. Uh, and we need to make sure that resources are shared equally and devolution is our next revolution. It will start once we've completed our election, we're going in earnest to introduce devolution, particularly in terms of the constitution with the provincial councils that are supposed to be put in place to make sure that we localize decision making. We also localize you know, the making of fundamental positions around policy in the local area. So it's something that we're going to implement soon after the elections. Uh, day one after the elections, you can be sure that will be in place. In fact, we're already putting a timetable of our work plan within 90 days. We must have rolled out issues to make sure that we are in line with the constitution around what is already contained and enshrined in the constitution. The second one is in terms of uh, the rigging of the elections. Yes, the perennial problem of the rigging of elections is also one issue that we are grappling with. But I can assure you that the issues we have put in place, particularly around the 10 demands uh, on the peace de document which we have put in place, which is the plan and environment for a credible election in Zimbabwe, is indicating the benchmarks for an election that we feel is going to give us a modicum and a semblance of a free and fair election. And those are the issues we are pushing. We even say that if it means that we are going to demonstrate, we are going to go into those demonstrating uh, activities so that we are able to push the current government into not just the lip service on free and fair election, but to act the need for free and fair election. Because right now, they are hoodwinking the whole world to say that Zimbabwe is open for business when it is closed for free and fair election. To say that Zimbabwe is open for business when we know that they are not open for a transparent uh, uh, political system in the country. Those are the issues we are tackling and we hope that will be supported by the international community to deal with those issues within the shortest possible time. Perfect, thank you. Um, now on to the next question. We will go to the lady in the second row. Hi, thank you so much for coming down. I really appreciate everything you've said and it's nice to get insight. I just wanted to ask, um, I've noticed among the party you've traveled with, there are a lot of men. <laughs> so sure. I wanted to know what are your plans on including more women into the party because Women in Zimbabwe represent about, what, 52% of the population? Yes, but they're that. not very represented in politics. And I want to know, as a member of the diaspora, my name is Varaid Sokativa, I was born and raised in Zimbabwe, very proud of that. I want to come back one day. After finishing my degree at Oxford, I intend on coming back. But I don't know what my place will be, like I said, being from the diaspora. So how do you intend on encouraging more students from the diaspora to come back and, like you said, use our skills in Zimbabwe? And how do you intend on bringing more women and integrating them into your party because you need representation and yeah. Thank you. Uh, you don't know what your home is. I can tell you that your home is Zimbabwe and you are going to be incorporated. We want more young women, particularly the skilled women, to be part of the political processes. And the part of the reason why we have had problems, Mr. President, is that Zimbabwe has been a terrain in the zone of political violence. So most of the women have been at the receiving end of participation in politics. But we have to chlorinate the environment, make it conducive for Varaiso to also be part of the process. And if you want that kind of an environment, trust President Chamisa and not another, then we can assure you that we'll be able to then invite you and be part of the process. Already in the country, we've put a quota system to make sure that there is a quota system, a 50% threshold at parliamentary level at local authority level for councillors so that we have more female uh, candidates 
coming to participate. But it's difficult because at times you have no takers because of the structural issues, but also because of the environment uh, you know, issues. And that's what we are trying to cure. So that at the end of the day, we have more young women. I mean, the future is very female. And I can assure you that we need more women and we meet, need more female cadres uh, who are active in politics. Look at uh, Theresa May, who is the prime minister here. She's an inspiration uh, to a lot of women across the whole world. You know, Angela Merkel um, and Salif Jensen recently, the outgoing president in, in Liberia. We need more women to be leading. Uh, and of course, uh, Varizo, I want you to be where I am soon after I've completed my two terms of office. Amen, by God's grace. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so next question, we will go to um, in the front row. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ngoni Mugwisi. I'm uh, doing my PhD in electrical engineering here. Uh, I have two quite unrelated questions. Uh, so the first one is uh, about the military. So the military had a huge role to play in the pseudo transition that we have seen in Zimbabwe, and I, I want like the way you're calling it. <laughs> <laughs> well. Uh, is the right place to do that is Oxford Union. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to know if you are at all worried about the military and the role that they are going to play. Uh, there's be, the military has been on record saying they wouldn't salute anybody who didn't participate in the uh, liberation struggle. Uh, so that's the first one. The second one, what are your thoughts on the legalization of marijuana in Zimbabwe uh, for medicinal purposes, of course? Uh, <laughs> do you think we are prepared for that? Uh, there are so many implications that have to be dealt with. Do you think that discussion has been heard in detail? Thank you. Powerful. Thank you very much. Uh, well, the, the second one is a bit tricky. D do you smoke marijuana? <laughs> <laughs> no, I do not. <laughs> thank you. Well, yeah. th 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 thank you. Thank you very much for those two questions. The first one about the military, two issues. The first one is that we are extremely concerned uh, that the military uh, of course, it's played a pivotal role in the politics of our country in the context of what happened in November, but also in the context of uh, what is happening now in terms of elections. In 2008, you are aware of what happened, that the military played a pivotal role. Uh, under normal circumstances, we do not want to see the military in villages or the villages militarized. So we need to demilitarize the villages and devillagize the military, make sure that we do not have our soldiers out of the barracks in the villages. What we want to see there is the politics of engagement by civilians so that they are able to usher in a dispensation of a representative democracy. So yes, we are concerned, but we are fortified by the fact that we also have uh, a lot of uh, soldiers who are professional, who respect the will of the people, who respect the will of the electorate. Yes, the electorate is always a problem, but you always have uh, those who would insist on why there was a liberation struggle, so that there's a sovereignty of the people. So we count on those who are professional, is a concern, but we're not worried. Because a concern, you have a response, but a worry, you do not have a response. So yes, we are concerned, but not worried in the sense that we have a way of going around it. And this is why we've insisted that we want to have an irrevocable declaration by the military that they will respect the will of the people. Once the people have voted, let the will of the people be respected. The ballot must be protected by the bullet, not to be undermined by it. But what we are seeing in Zimbabwe is that the bullet seeks to replace the ballot, when in fact the whole essence of going to the liberation struggle was for the bullet to preserve the ballot. And that's how it's supposed to be. In the context of the people having voted, that will have to be protected by all of us through our institutions that are supposed to do it. So I hope that is answered. Now on the second one, on the marijuana, uh, you know, that one is again going back to the policy making narrative that we need to be able to resolve. Our government operates on the basis of adocracy, a lot of policy inconsistency, elite decision making. Once you're about to make such important decisions which have health concerns, health implications, you need to involve the community and the people. So there has to be an involvement of citizens in terms of such decisions. There was no involvement of the people. It came as a shock. Midnight, uh, the decision was announced. We do not know who is going to benefit out of that, whether the citizens are happy or not happy. 
there has to be some kind of a consensus in terms of decision making around that. And this is what we're going to review to say what is the view of the people because all decisions have to be people centered and that's where we're going to go. Thank you. Uh, we have time for a couple more questions, um, so we'll now go to the second row. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I do have two qu questions, if I may. The, f the first one is... Uh, just one, if that's all right. I, uh, <laughs> yeah, yes, sure, so certainly. No, the, the, the one question uh, <laughs> pertains to, to uh, environmental matters. As, as we probably all know, um, Zimbabwe is home to uh, a broad and a very uh, beautiful variety of, 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 of animals, Wildlife, which, men yes. which many people come to, come to, come to visit, sure. and, 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 and we all seek to protect. Sure. Though, likewise, which is also a very controversial topic in this country, is the matter of, 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 of especially Westerners coming for big game hunting. What, what are, is this your stance on, on, on this? And do you think is, this is something that should be uh, considered critically or that this should be, um, could be a way of, of enhancing the, the um, well, e economic range of, 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 of um, well, um, gain, gaining assets and, and income in, 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 in Zimbabwe? Well, I'm also sure if I got your question right, but um, wildlife, is very important in the history of our country, in the heritage of our country. I'm extremely concerned that the current government has been uh, shipping out bab elephants, mostly to China, selling them without the regard to certain protocols that are supposed to be respected. The plunder of wildlife is a worrisome development. And as we form the next government, our biggest issue is going, you know, the lion, uh, Cecil, and what happened to our lion uh, in Zimbabwe. Those are the issues. It speaks to vulnerability of our flora and fauna, the vulnerability of our wildlife. These are the issues we are going to be focusing on in terms of our environmental policy. Not only are we advocating for a green Zimbabwe and a green agenda, we also have a robust strategy to make sure that we do not only protect but preserve other species that are protected from a tourist point of view, so that we are able to end foreign currents, but also from a heritage point of view. It's part of our national heritage. It's part of a global heritage, because people would want to appreciate these God-given resources. Obviously, to be able to do that, you need a government that is sensitive to such considerations around wildlife and its protection. So those are issues that are very key. As we launch our document, our policy document next week, is something that is quite key in terms of how we are going to protect wildlife and particularly animals um, uh, that are in the conservancy. That is implies banning big game hunting. Sorry? Does that imply banning big game hunting? No, no, no. Definitely we are not going to ban, but it has to be regulated in a manner as to preserve the wildlife. But certainly not a ban. Thank you. Um, next question will go to the lady. Um, just, yeah. Thank you, President Chamisa. We are so delighted to be here. We're looking forward for this day. Anyway, my question is, uh, when we go home, Zimbabwe, we are treated as foreigners, is particularly at the airport. And you're wondering, is this my home? Um, then furthermore, there's this, uh, we have so many skills we see some problems. We have some problems, water, sewage, and everything. But we feel that we can solve this problem, but there's no chance. Even voluntarily, there's no way you can do that. Well, thank you. At least one problem solved. <laughs> uh, now, because we have a solution there, and a solutioner, uh, that makes it easy for, for the country. But I must say that um, we are conscious of the Zimbabweans we have in the diaspora and even in Zimbabwe, who are willing to contribute to their country. But it is not possible because our government is too closed. And this is why I said government is open for business but closed to its citizens in terms of contribution on the solutions. We are going to engage all Zimbabweans, yourself included, to find a common solution to our country. I mean, there's no nation which is without answers. It only becomes a nation without answers once you begin to close out those who have answers and solutions. And this is why we want to make sure that we open our country uh, for purposes of debate, for purposes of answers, for purposes of making policies. And our policy is very clear in terms of engaging 
uh, citizens, uh, so that we have a restoration of citizens. Zimbabweans have been treated as subjects where they are supposed to be treated as citizens. And we need to move away from citizens being suspected by their own government so that they are taken as stakeholders who are able to contribute meaningfully to their forward upliftment and development of, work of their country. So thank you for that contribution. I think we are together and we are agreed in terms of ushering in a new dispensation. And this is why we are you know, exhorting you to come and support the effort for transformation. Transformation by voting a young president. The youngest president on the African continent. <laughs> Thank you. We have time for one final question, uh, and we'll go to the gentleman uh, wearing glasses. Okay, thank you. Um, I want, first of all, maybe to thank um, uh, Mr. Chamisa, but also notably Mr. Beatty, the alliance partners who have traveled all the way from Zimbabwe to thank be you, here and you. to send this message to the world, which we really appreciate. I was in Bedford yesterday, but I said I should come back here want to reiterate the question which was raised at the beginning. I've been here 18 years. I graduated at Oxford University, want to contribute the best I can. I've been you know, back to Zimbabwe several times, but I feel when I land at the airport, I always kind of start crying. Even now, I don't feel I am Zimbabwean. Now, the diaspora vote is very important. And I want to ask a question and make a statement. Question is, yesterday, and I think all along we've been saying, the government is saying there are logistical problems. What are the logistical problems? We have answers. Every person in Zimbabwe, outside Zimbabwe, Australia, wherever, and I think there are you know, voters on both sides people who vote Munangwaga, people who vote Chamisa, people who vote whoever is contesting. We have solutions to whatever so logistical problems they may purport to be there. I am, will sacrifice rather than flying to Zimbabwe. I could to vote, but I should be able to vote here at the embassy. We want to have an answer. What are the logistical problems? And Zimbabweans in the diaspora have solutions. We have three months. There is ample time to be able to fix those problems so that we can vote. Well, I appreciate. I mean, I, we're in the same boat. I totally accept that Zimbabweans have to be allowed to vote. It's an emotional issue. But the biggest logistical issue is the government itself. And that is the logistical issue we must deal with. The current mindset of those in authority is that they would want to shut out their citizens out of decision making. They would want to treat their own citizens as foreigners, which is something that we must correct. Now, we have tried to reason with them. There's a constitutional court application that was made. It has not yet been determined. Again, we are pushing to make sure that uh, Zimbabweans in the diaspora are allowed to vote. It's a big issue. It's a big, big, big issue that is going to determine how these elections are going to be pronounced free and fair. Thank you. We actually have uh, time for a couple more questions. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. We'll go to the gentleman uh, in the pink shirt. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chimisa, thank you very much for coming to us tonight. Uh, I have a question about uh, Mr. Evan Morari was here a couple of months ago. And he said uh, he was speaking very eloquently. He was talking about his movement, which he started in Zimbabwe. And he was saying that it was so much about the youth. And you've also mentioned tonight about how how your, your movement is about the youth as well. But there seems to be a problem across the African continent, and Evan Morari was talking about this in Zimbabwe, that he doesn't feel like people have enough faith to vote in a young leader. So what would you say to those critics? And do you think that something needs to change in Zimbabwe before someone under the age of 60 can be voted into power? I'm sure your answer is going to be coming very soon in July. <laughs> But I can tell you that um, you know, throughout the history of nations, it is the young people who always are at the center of revolutions. You talk about the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, you talk about the United Kingdom. Total transformation is only possible when young people are engaged and when young people are taking charge of their destiny. And I can tell you that within our own situation in Zimbabwe, I've been chosen to represent by the 
elderly people are going to the rural areas, there is actually more acceptance in the villages because they appreciate that they need young people to be at the center of decision making on their behalf. Yes, I, I know that there is um, um, others who may think that there's skepticism around young people, but I can tell you that it's not a problem that I've encountered. Where I'm getting my support is from the elderly. Uh, if you look at um, uh, the African continent, even during the liberation struggles, it is the young Mugabe, like I indicated, who were entrusted with the liberation of their countries. Um, you talk about South Africa in the ANC, you talk about Kanu, all the liberation movements were led by fairly young people. Um, and that is the nature of all critical revolutions and struggles. This struggle for transformation is going to be led by ourselves, young people. And I'm there to lead. I know that Ivan Maware is one of the, he doesn't have a movement outside the movement. We are all together with Ivan and others who are young to look at the common view to make sure that we do what is best for our country during our lifetime. Thank you. Um, so one final question. Um, we'll go to the gentleman. Thanks. I wanted to ask you as a lawyer, there's been a second transition, a quieter one, to a new judicial leadership from Chijgao Siku to Malaba. And I wanted to ask you for your sense of the position of the, the judiciary, its state of health, the independence of the judiciary, especially the Constitutional Court at this crucial time. Well, I, 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 li I like your taxonomy or classification of this development to say it's a second transition. Uh, th that's a very nice one, yes. I must say that um, the judiciary is an important arm. Uh, justice is the cornerstone of societal stability in resolution of uh, disputes within societies or nations. And in our context, I must say that we have a judiciary that we feel uh, has uh, the necessary latitude to be able to uh, meaningfully uh, deliver a semblance of a, a democratic dispensation. And given the chance, you know, I've worked with them as an advocate, I know that most of the judges are judges whom I know are competent. Yes, you always have bad apples in any basket. It doesn't mean that you must condemn the entire basket. Uh, but I must say that it's a good start, and I think the transition is good. Uh, it's actually um, a precursor to the transition that we are going to see in the political uh, context in this election that is going to come. That is when you are going to see real change. That is when you are going to see a new man uh, who is coming, and you are looking at that new man, and you must be happy that it is a punctuation of what you have seen in the judiciary. Yes, it's a development which is positive, and this is why government has tried to reverse the way our judges are appointed, because they were not comfortable with the process that was beyond uh, manipulation by any of the political players. And this is what we want to uh, continue in the new dispensation, which is about to come in July. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, that's all we have time for this evening. Please join me in thanking Nelson Tumisa for joining us. <laughs>